there's a pretty simple way to make your D&D world feel way more real for the players. And lately, I've been thinking about a different way to leverage it to make the player characters more connected to that world. And this one, we're going to take a look at factions. I always get a lot of questions whenever I mention factions, and I think it's due in part to how the Dungeon Master's Guide talks about them. There are five big factions in Forgotten Realms, and the DMG lays out a point system to track each character's renown with each faction, and they can climb the ranks and gain titles, and now this could grant the PCs perks and access to specific downtime activities which sounds awesome, but then they stop talking about it and leave it up to us to make essentially a mini game by ourselves. Now, I went a ways down that road myself once, more than once, because I thought it was super cool if an underdeveloped concept, but I stopped when I realized my players simply did not care about joining these factions. Now, every table's different, but out of the several different groups I've run, people just kind of like bounced off the idea of joining the Harpers or whatever. And I think there are two main reasons for that. One, the way the book talks about factions, it is pretty much like a one player game and D&D is usually a, a group sport. But two is the bigger one, I believe. The players don't wanna join a faction, they want to be a faction. So for a while, I decided factions were dumb and threw out the baby with the bathwater until I realized that factions are super useful for the dungeon master and the player characters if they are smart. So I am starting to fold them back into my world building and I've unlocked their real benefit, verisimilitude. I am all about verisimilitude, the word itself, and the idea of bringing more depth and truthiness to the game so it feels alive. If you've been watching me for a while, you know I'm a huge fan of good tables that organically create situations and interactions that make it feel like the dice and the player's decisions are driving the action, and I am witnessing the world responding to like that tangled web of cause and effect playing out in real time. Now, I will admit it took me a while to get comfortable enough behind the Dungeon Master's screen to surrender that much control, but loosening your grip on the reins is totally worth it because then you get to watch the world you've built do stuff by itself. That's what makes this game awesome for me, at least one of the main things that makes this game awesome for me, and I hope you get to experience it for yourself. That's why I'm making the Game Master's Compendium of Explosive Creation and including a table of friendly factions for each of the 50 character archetypes included within it. I'm very excited, but listen, factions are one of the main things making stuff happen within your game world. Now, it's pretty easy to explain how a faction like the Cult of Ancient Evil or like the Army of the Hobgoblin King are groups that can drive action within your campaign. And there are definitely evil, and let's call them evil-leaning <laughs> factions in here, but that's a different table in the spreads, and we'll get to that in a different video, because here we're focusing in on friendly factions separately, because I've realized how, like, functional and neglected they are in many adventures. A faction is a group with a common identity and or common values. In real life and the world you're building, People tend to get together to feel a sense of community and share resources and to make things happen way more efficiently than they can on their own, right? Pretty simple. So a friendly faction in a Dungeons & Dragons game is not only going to provide some flavorful world building, it's going to make things happen. This group wants things, and that can mean quests for our heroes. This group knows things, and that can mean key information, lore drops, rumors, and clues, connections to other factions that know other things. Factions can also have stuff, goods and services they can provide for a price, be it in coin or in service, as in rewards. Old Man Jones might not have a lot of liquid assets lying around the farm to pay our heroes, you know, to stop those thieved gerblins from stealing his prized hogs, but the Farmer's Combine can get together and provide a pretty hefty bounty on gerblin ears. And then when the PCs level up and head out to the big city, they might not know anybody there, but 
the representative of the farmer's combine has heard all about them and they set the characters up with the place to stay maybe and the next round of adventures. Of course, if you've been running games for a while, you know there's also a chance things go sideways and the farmer's combine ends up using its membership dues to hire assassins to track down those no good murder hobos who screwed over old man Jones a few levels ago. Here's the part that I've been getting excited about recently and I am building into the compendium. Just take a second and imagine in that last example if one of the player characters was a farmer before they became an adventurer and had a built-in connection to the farmer's combine from the jump. There's a ton of potential there, making the character feel like they have a place and connections in this world and giving the DM a way to have old man Jones roll up with a plot hook or something and have it be way more engaging from the jump. Yes, he's offering 10 gold pieces to clear out those gerblins, but also this dude helped your granddaddy raise the barn and he knows those big wigs in charge of the farmer's combine combine up at headquarters in the big city. Now maybe a player gets excited about gaining favor and rising in status or even taking a leadership role in a faction. Maybe it just unlocks the social side of the game for them and gives them a way to interact with and influence NPCs in a way that actually feels consequential. If they get a discount or a big clue from a faction because of what they've done for that faction, the world is going to start feeling way more real to them and they are going to realize it benefits them to treat it as such. It's good to have friends. And when the players have totally hit a dead end and you can maybe pretend to roll some dice behind the screen and say, hey, you actually know somebody who might be able to help. You're going to love that you included some factions in your game. Let's look at a spread from the GM's compendium of explosive creation. And I want you to think about different ways you could use factions in your next adventure. Now the tables in here are organized by character archetype. Though you could always grab a faction from any spread, the concept is to have a built-in way to make things even more relevant and engaging based on the player characters. There are D4 friendly factions in each spread. I set up the left-hand page so you roll a fistful of the standard TTRPG dice, D4, D6, D8, D10, D12, and boom, you've got a character. Fun, right? At least I think so. I put the factions under the D4 because you actually don't want to overdo it with them. If a player forms a connection with one, you want to keep them relevant if you can and not just replace them arbitrarily. Maybe the faction's concerns even mature with the campaign thanks in a big part to the PC's actions. Let's go Animal Whisperer this time. I had a lot of fun with these. Let's say you have a player character who's a ranger or a druid, or maybe just somebody with a pet or a familiar. Maybe they used to have one, and we've gotten ourselves a John Wick situation here. There's, there's different ways to get there. Again, I'd love for you to be thinking about how you could drop one of these factions in your world and what purpose it could serve to drive the story. Also, think about how it might feel if your DM turned to you and said, oh, yeah, your character goes way back with these guys. They might have something useful. Let's roll us a d4. And we've got a two. All right. <laughs> the Owl Bear Collective. Isolated forest commune who eschews arcana, tech, and clothing. You're walking through the woods and somebody calls the ranger's name and it's this naked hippie who's part of some back to nature commune that knows these forests better than anybody. Maybe that's not your cup of tea, but I could run with that for a while. I bet some of you have kept reading and got down to four by now, the Sasquatch Society, cryptid seekers, though most are just there to hike and socialize. Some yahoos just hanging out in the wilderness with like a mini keg, pretending to look for some mythical creature. I mean, this is D&D. &D. You want a Bigfoot in your game? Go for it. Maybe they find one and grab a giant ape stat block and you're good to go, baby. Or maybe the Sasquatch Society has found something else, a dead body or the entrance to a dungeon. Or maybe they're just chilling, but they heard the mayor in the next town over has been acting pretty crazy. I don't know what the most useful way for you to use them in your game right now would be. All I know is I love these guys. I, I would want to talk to them. Even if we ran into them again later, if I was a player, I would be psyched. Even if I wasn't playing an animal whisperer with a connection to them. I hope this got your imaginative juices flowing. That's the main goal of the compendium, to give you a ton of ideas and make the whole process fast and 
fun. It's about to launch on Kickstarter. Link below to sign up to hear when it goes live or subscribe to this channel. Follow me on social media because we'll be talking about it. Also, a link to my Redbubble if you want a sweet shirt like this origami verdigree dragon. If I succeeded to ignite some creative sparks about friendly factions in this one, you're probably thinking about NPCs to populate them. So up next, we're talking about assets and allies. I hope I see you there. Until next time, be kind, have fun.